All right, internet, welcome back. So it's been a while since we've seen each other and hopefully this, uh, the time between videos are not as long as uh, you know future videos. So what we're gonna do here is this is hopefully gonna be a prolonged series specifically related to zero knowledge proofs. And there's a variety of reasons as to why I've chosen to pursue this technology or this path of learning. Um, to keep it short, in a nutshell, it's a cutting edge technology within the crypto ecosystem. Um, the applications of this technology is, is very wide. It's applied to more than just crypto. Uh, and additionally, um, from my readings and understanding, the security ecosystem related to this is very nascent. It's, it's very um, little related to traditional smart contract auditing. So the point of this is basically to learn as much as possible about the topic and potentially contribute towards that ecosystem of helping at least convey new ideas around security within the ecosystem, um, but also just to share the knowledge around this topic in general. Um, so that's one of the big reasons as to why I wanted to share this, uh, this video with you, also this blog post and all the hopefully future videos and blog posts associated to it. So this very first blog post in this video is gonna be a very introductory. So it's super high level. Um, it's gonna be a grab bag of topics that's gonna to be bouncing all over the place. There's no specific niche area that we're gonna dive into today at least. In future videos, my goal is to narrow the scope for each video and each post so we can basically talk about a specific topic and go semi-deep so we can grow our knowledge increment by increment and build on it with baby steps. So that's the premise of why I chose the topic and, and where we're headed, hopefully. All right, so um, before jumping into the blog post, I did wanna share a specific list. And in that list is tons and tons of links. So I'm gonna link that list inside of the description of this video. And also I'll try to link any, uh, any resources I show within the screen here in the description as well. But if it's not linked in the description, I promise you that it's either in the blog post or in that list of resources. Um, so with that list of res resources is a GitHub page um, that I've created. And it's basically a list of lists. So it's an aggregated list of resources related to the zero knowledge proofs. So in here you can see it's broken up by section. So we have introductory content, we have courses that you can take, lists of lists. So this is basically awesome lists in relation to um, zero knowledge proof uh, resources. So you can see this is an awesome list from ZK Sync. There's a bunch of other lists in here. An interesting one that I recently found is the Canon from A16Z. This is massive and uh, there's a bunch of other stuff. So we have Moon Math. And specifically for this, I'm going to add to this Moon Math section and also I'm gonna to add to all the other sections and potentially build more sections on top of that. So this is a living document and I'm gonna to try to add to it as much as possible as I go throughout this learning journey. The next piece here is security. So security related to zero knowledge proofs. I pulled some links from Trail of Bits and also uh, Dillendum. Dillendum, I don't know how to pronounce that. Let's see if Google does. Nope, or maybe they do. Oh, what is that? No, they don't, okay. All right, so these are a series of resources related specific to the vulnerabilities, exploits, and security around um, zero knowledge proofs. And that's definitely a section that uh, we'll spend a lot of time in. But first and foremost, I think before we jump in directly into security, we should get a strong foundation of the technology itself before we start thinking about the flaws and exploits inside of it. Um, so there's a lot of stuff we need to cover before we get to that, but we'll definitely dive into that in the future. So this will be shared with you in the description so you can dive into it and uh, check out those links. So the next thing I wanted to show are a few things. So we have here our groupings of tabs. So you can see every time I open one of these inside of Chrome, there's gonna be a bunch of tabs associated. And those tabs are basically the flow as to how I'd like to convey this video. And this flow really kind of relates to this blog post and how the blog post is structured and how I kind of talk through the topic. Um, in addition to that, I have some notes here that are really like a, a bad version of the blog post. So we'll probably stick with this most of the time to walk through the structure of what I wanted to convey, what I wanted to talk about. So the first thing first, this is actually not mentioned in the blog post, this is exclusively in the video. So look at you getting exclusive content. Uh, part of the reason I wanted to point this out is this actually is kind of a philosophy that is underpinning a lot of the videos I've created historically. And that's basically learning in public. So I posted a long time ago, uh, I think back in 2018 or 2019, um, the premise of learning in public and the importance of it um, for a variety of reasons, both it kind of forces you to learn in a more effective way, but also it's a good way to build a community around um, people that want to continuously learn about around, around a variety of topics. I was inspired specifically by this podcast here, Free Code Camp with uh, Sean Wang, and he's actually gone off and created tons of stuff since I originally listened to him. So this was back in, what was the date here? 
I think 2018, it's 2019. There you go. So in 2019, I've came across this podcast and ever since then I've been trying to basically consistently put out content related to learning in public. So if you're interested, I'll link all this stuff in the description and you can learn more about the process of learning in public. So let's get to the content here. So zero knowledge proofs. The introductory part of this blog post really talks to you kind of like what are zero knowledge proofs? Why do they exist? And what's the purpose of them? So there are a variety of examples of how someone would actually explain this topic. And here I've listed out some of the more popular ones that I've come across. So there are people that give examples around someone that's colorblind and they're trying to prove to like, someone that's not colorblind, trying to prove to another person that they're not colorblind through showing different colored um, balls and things like that. Uh, another one here is a specific uh, cave for Alibaba. We'll probably walk through that one. Alibaba's cave. Another one is a fake telecom company I've seen. And also another one is where, where's Waldo. So we'll probably talk through where's Waldo and Alibaba's cave because those are simplistic examples that won't take me too long to explain. And these tend to be some of the main ways people explain zero knowledge proofs, at least in the beginning. After you get past the basic introduction, people will start to actually talk about the flaws in this explanation and also give you obviously more details and less abstract kind of high level concepts. But we'll stick with the high level examples today, most likely. And through that, uh, in future videos, we'll dive deeper into the more um, crunchy examples and really get into the details of each specific implementation of different types of zero knowledge proofs. So with that being stated, let's go to an example. So this example here is World's Where's Waldo that I've walked through specifically. And I pulled this example from Xerox Sage, which I think is not linked there. So we will open it up here. And Xerox Sage has actually done a really good job of the Ethernet series as well. And here they walk through the specific example of Where's Waldo. So in this example, um, we have Alice and Bob. So Alice here wants to prove to Bob that she has the ability or she knows exactly where Waldo is in the map. But Bob does not believe her. So what Alice has to do or Alice wants to do is she wants to prove to Bob that she knows where Waldo is without exactly show, without showing um, Bob where Waldo is. So if we go to the example here, there's different ways that she can prove that. So there's one path, there's path one and path two. So path one here is Alice could actually just go through here and she could cut out Waldo. So cut Waldo out and then send Waldo over to Bob and say, hey, hey, here's here's Waldo, Bob. I'm not going to show you where he was, but here's here's Waldo from the picture. So that's one option. Another option is she could actually use a cardboard cutout. So this is a piece of cardboard or a piece of paper. And what she's going to do is she's going to cut a small hole inside of this piece of paper and she's going to overlay that hole on top of the map of where Waldo is sitting. So Bob can actually see Waldo but he cannot see anything else around Waldo. He only sees Waldo. And that's actually gonna show Bob that she knows where Waldo is without actually um, showing where Waldo is located on the map for Bob. So the premise of this example is simply having someone state something to another person without actually having to show them that thing. So it's an example here is saying that, uh, I know a specific number, but I don't necessarily want to convey that number to you. But I want you to believe the fact that I do know that number. So that's basically the premise of this entire concept of zero knowledge proofs is I'm proving something to you without relaying any knowledge, hence zero knowledge. And specifically with this example, what we're doing is we're going to iterate through this. So this is just one iteration of you show of Alice showing Bob that she knows where Waldo is. Well, what's going to happen here is they're going to iterate through this many, many times. So hundreds and hundreds and thousands of times, Alice is going to continuously on different maps where Waldo is located, prove that she knows where Waldo is without showing Bob where exactly Waldo is. So that's one of the examples that I've come across that kind of conveys the concept of zero knowledge proofs. Another one that I thought was quite interesting is um, this cave, this cave situation. So let's say we have Bob and Alice again here. Um, I'm sure they use, I think there's another one of like Eve or something like that, but we'll say just um, Bob and Alice for short. So we have Alice here inside of uh, Alibaba's cave. And then we have um, Bob over here. So Bob is standing outside of the cave. Alice has gone into the cave. And really what we want to do here is Alice wants to prove to Bob that she knows the magic word to this magical door over here. And what's going to happen is Alice is going to enter the cave, either one of two paths. So if she goes down path A, she gets here 
And Bob out here on the outside is going to say, um, Alice, I want you to count, uh, come out of the cave from B path instead of A. And he can basically say one of two paths. So he's not going to see when she goes down what path. She's going to go down the path. Bob is then going to enter the cave and say, come down path B. So if he says, come down path B, then Alice has to know the magic word to the door or she won't be able to actually go down this path. So if she knows it, she'll come out of path B and then that's going to improve Bob's confidence that Alice actually knows the magic word to this door. Now, if they do this over hundreds and hundreds and thousands of times, if Alice gets it right every single time, then Bob's confidence slowly increases over time. And, you know, Bob could start with maybe 10% confidence, then it goes to 15%, then it goes to 20, and eventually gets up to probably 99.9999%. Because after, you know, a couple hundred thousand times of Alice getting this correct, then Bob has almost no reason as to why she would be lying or, or falsely, you know, tricking him into thinking that um, she knows what's going on, or she knows, she doesn't know the, the password. Um, so that's kind of the premise there for that example. And... As you can see, they, uh, they've kind of depicted this here. So you can see that we have Alice goes into the cave, Bob goes into the cave and says, hey, come outside of A. And when she comes outside of A, he says, okay, that's correct. You've, you've proved to me that you at least know the password to the magic door. Let's do this a couple hundred thousand more times to prove, um, to really get that proof through. So that's another example. Um, like I said, there's tons and tons of examples here, but those are the main ones that I wanted to share with you. Oh, and I did have Xerox Sages blog post open. Good job, Pastel. All right, so this is just another example. I'm not gonna walk through this, but this is the one related to the telecom company. Um, and I, th I would say this example specifically is um, more realistic to how zero knowledge proofs function and it's in more detail. The other two I just shared are very high level, but it gets across the point of the definition for zero knowledge proofs. You're proving something without relaying any knowledge, hence zero knowledge. But this one is definitely more detailed. So if you wanna get into a more detailed example, I'd recommend going to this one here. And this is going to be under Matthew Green's resource. And this last one is uh, the red ball, green ball situation. Um, so, I mean, simply put, what's going to happen is you have someone that's blind and someone that's um, not, not blind, no, colorblind, not blind, blind. So this person here is going to be colorblind. This person is going to not be colorblind. This person here wants to prove to this person that they actually are not colorblind. Um, so what this person is going to do is they're going to take two balls. One's going to be red, one's going to be green. They're going to put it behind their back. They're then going to show one ball to the person that is potentially not colorblind. That person is going to look at it and say, okay, I know what color it is. This person is then going to take the balls and put them behind their back and then rotate them or not rotate them, depending on what they want to do. They're going to then show the ball to the person. That person is going to say, um, did I switch balls? Yes or no. This person is going to say yes if they did and no if they didn't. And if they keep getting that correct, similar to the cave situation, um, over a couple hundred thousand times, we can eventually prove the fact that this person actually is not colorblind. So that's another example. Those are some of the examples of how um, zero knowledge proofs are conveyed, at least in a basic way. Um, one additional resource I'd recommend for understanding more kind of like the simplistic. Oh. Sorry about that being really loud and fast. Oh, no. Stop, stop, stop. stop. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> it's very exciting. Um, so what I wanted to show here basically is the fact that um, this is a really great resource, uh, especially with Wired. They do a lot of these great five level difficulty explanations. I think this guy did a great job at explaining zero knowledge proofs as well. So if you want to kind of listen to it in different levels, um, that'd be another good source as well. All right. So that is done. Let's go to applications. So this is a question that I commonly ask myself and I've posted this in the, the blog post. So at, at the next section, it's, it's why do I care, basically. And that's something that I tend to ask myself on a consistent basis when I'm learning a new topic. It's really important to understand what is the application of this concept. Um, learning things theoretically and just to learn things is nice, but you can only do that so far. And then you finally get to a point where you're like, all right, well, if there's no actual real world application, then I'm kind of wasting my time. At least that's what I think sometimes. But um, we ask ourselves this question, we do some research. And we're doing some research. I pulled uh, tons and tons of applications for zero knowledge proofs. Some are futuristic applications of how they could be applied and some are things of how they're being applied today. So here's some resources that I came across that actually talk through this. So this specific resource called Not Boring is actually an amazing blog. So I've, I just came across it and I'm very impressed by this person around how um, prolific they are as a writer. 
and how you know simplistic their conversations are and, and the, their explanations of topics, which is very impressive. Um, but anyways, in this example, they're doing renting an apartment. So this is an example of walking through how zero knowledge proofs can be applied to renting an apartment. In this explanation, the premise is that if uh, I want to rent an apartment from an agent and they ask me for, for a whole bunch of information, sort of like, hey, I need your income statements for the last 12 months. I need your social security number, your birth date, and all the other things that come with renting, uh, renting a place. You wouldn't necessarily have to share all that with them. All you would have to do is say, what are the specific um, criteria I need to meet to rent this apartment? And then I'm going sh to prove to you that I actually meet those criteria without actually relaying or sharing that criteria with you. And in this example, they walk through specifically uh, a, a simple way of doing that. And I'm not going to walk through it here, but there's a, there's a, this isn't realistic, but it's just one way of conveying how zero knowledge proofs could help with this. Um, below that are some more sophisticated examples you can see. And those really talk through a variety of things. I think, I'm not sure if I highlighted it here or not, but I did in the blog post here because I'm good. I think like that. All right. Da, 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 da. Ah, okay. Here's an interesting one. So this is one that I thought was quite interesting, which is enterprises that can utilize your knowledge proofs while staying compliant. Specifically in this blog post, they talk about that briefly, not too much. And in there, they're, t they're touching on specifically that in zero knowledge proofs or different implementations of it, a enterprise or a person can convey certain bits of information, but not all information. So you can selectively choose what you provide. And as an enterprise, you could selectively provide different information to a certain party to ensure that you're in compliance with whatever, whatever regulations um, kind of suit to your industry. So that was um, one interesting piece that I really appreciated for applications. Another one was this, uh, this paper here. And honestly, this paper here from uh, Maxime, let's go to the top to give this person credit. Um, this person here, Maxime, they've done an amazing job. I think this is probably one of the most thorough pieces of information I found related to zero knowledge proofs. Obviously, you can see that it's, it's, it's focusing on ZK snarks. Um, we'll get on that in a second, but it's probably one of the most detailed as well as the one of most the uh, approachable pieces that I've come across that really talk through a lot of the nuances that come with zero knowledge proofs without necessarily overwhelming the reader, um, which I appreciate it. So great job to that person. All right. So um, in the introduction, there is a list of applications that talk through specifically how this can be applied. Uh, there's two applications I wanted to highlight that really kind of just caught my interest and in, uh, and kind of not, I guess surprised me is outsourcing computation. So I've heard a lot of people talk about trustless computing and people refer to outsourcing computation, but I never really intuitively understood what that meant. And I've not really heard many people go into detail as how that is done. And after reading a lot about zero knowledge proofs and intuiting kind of the basics of what it does, this starts to make a lot more sense where one application of zero knowledge proofs is you'd actually be able to outsource expensive computations to providers such as AWS and different uh, cloud service providers. And what they could do is they could actually send back a, uh, some sort of proof to validate that the results um, that they sent back are correct and the execution was done the way you've asked it to be done. The reason this is interesting is you're able to actually send off this information and have them compute it, send it back to you and send it back in a way that you're not necessarily relaying or sharing an information that you shouldn't share. And I'm assuming that if homomorphic encryption is somewhat baked into this application or this futuristic scenario, then there could be an opportunity to send off your information to a provider, have them compute it and send you back the, the proof that it's been computed correctly without you having to recompute it on your side to validate that it's correct. And you could do it in a way where you're actually not relaying or sharing the information with that person at all. So they're basically computing on encrypted information. Um, that's probably further out because I know that there's a lot of uh, a lot of advancements that need to be made and hard problems for that to actually get to scale. But that's one really interesting um, use case. This other one here is relaying mainly to ZK rollups within the, the Ethereum ecosystem. And we'll talk more about that in a second. And that's probably where we'll spend most of our time in future videos partly due to the fact that when it comes to zero knowledge proofs, most of the time when you hear about that concept within the crypto ecosystem, people are mainly talking about ZK rollups in the context of Ethereum and maybe some other um, L1 chains. So that is another application. And this one here is from Amber Group. 
And the one thing I wanted to mention here, so this entire blog post specifically talks about ZK rollups. So the entire thing is around ZK rollups and navigating the ecosystem of ZK rollups. And it's a really good post to really just get an understanding of the market, who's playing where, what they're doing and how they're leveraging it. The one thing I wanted to point out here that I thought was quite fascinating in the way they conveyed it was you can see that within Ethereum, it's in some ways an anti-network effect ecosystem where as it scales, it's harder to use for people. And that kind of goes against the ethos of, you know, a lot of social network companies and SaaS companies and the Silicon Valley mindset of when you scale, things should be more efficient and easier for the user and hopefully cheaper for the company. And that's kind of where ZK rollups come into play, where in this situation, potentially, um, ZK rollups will actually be the kind of the yin to the yang of this situation. So if Ethereum is anti-network effect, then ZK rollups are basically, a, uh, they offer the strong network effects of transaction costs um, for the network usage. So for ZK rollups, as they scale up, the ability to have lower transaction costs actually increases as more people use the platform. And the details as to how this happens is slightly over my head. So in future videos, I'll be able to explain that better. But I think the interesting piece here is that it's a, it's a, it's a puzzle, right? So we have one piece here with Ethereum where it's focusing on security and decentralization. And then we have ZK rollups, which are also focusing on decentralization in the long term, but in the short term, their proving ecosystem is somewhat centralized. But either way, these things, when you put them together, it allows you to kind of get the best of both worlds, where you have something that's secure and decentralized and something that can help scale the ecosystem without necessarily compromising um, any of the philosophies between the two. And there's very little trade-offs that have to be made when sticking them together. So I hope that makes sense. And uh, this is definitely a good post to read through to get a better idea of kind of the ecosystem for um, rollups. So I think those are all the applications. Let's double check, double check the notes here. Uh, ah, so this is one interesting thing that's unrelated to applications, but I thought that it was uh, good enough to share. So in this panel conversation, um, Vitalik basically stated this quote here, that in, this, in the context of this quote, the uh, host of the panel asked, what are some future predictions that you have for specifically zero knowledge proofs? And Vitalik basically stated that over the next 10 years, it will become recognized that ZK snarks, a specific type of zero knowledge proof, are at least as important um, a technology as blockchains. And I feel like that's really interesting to hear from a person that basically created Ethereum or didn't create it himself, but is one of the founders of Ethereum. So I think it's really interesting to see someone put so much weight behind this technology that already has so much weight behind a technology they've dedicated you know, many, many years of their life towards. So that was pretty, I would say inspiring. Um, so the next thing here, what are some of the main elements? So the main elements of ZK, there are tons and tons of elements related to zero knowledge proofs. So I'm not necessarily gonna list them all here. I just wanted to mention a few of the elements that I've come across reoccurringly through the reading that I've done in the past week. So these are things that people have repeated over and over and over and mentioned throughout their explanations their introductory explanations for zero knowledge proofs that I wanted to highlight here for you. So first and foremost is the examples that I just walked you through earlier, those were considered um, interactive proofs. And this really comes down to the interactivity of zero knowledge proofs. For an interactive proof, what's gonna happen here is Alice and Bob have to interact with each other to validate that um, Alice is telling the truth. So Alice has to give something to Bob, Bob has to validate that, or has to check the proof and then has to send it back to Alice and, and say yes or no, I believe you or not. The thing with crypto and the crypto ecosystem, there's a heavy reliance on non-interactive proofs. And the reason there's such a heavy reliance on non-interactive proofs is that this, is allow, this allows us to scale. And the reason it allows us to scale is with a non-interactive proof, you no longer need two parties to be on the network at the same time. And the reason that's useful is because everybody's not on the network at the same time all the time. So if I'm able to trust the fact, or at least validate later on, that a proof the prover provided to me is valid, or is valid, then I can um, I don't have to be there for that to happen. So the prover can keep on proving a series of proofs unrelated just to what I want them to prove. Now there's a bunch of explanations 
for how um, non-interactive proofs work. I will definitely have the interactivity piece of Dear Knowledge Proofs as a separate post. So that'll be a separate post and a separate video walking through the details of that. But to give you a brief explanation that's gonna be probably butchered in many ways, and I'm sure in the future when I look back at this video, I'll cringe a little bit, but hey, that's the process of learning in public. So the point that I wanted to make here is that with non-interactive proofs, let's go to the, these presentations. So there's a presentation, oh no, that was so loud. I'm so bad at, I'm so sorry for making everything so loud. All right, so we're gonna go back to this um, paper. Let's go to the paper that I have from this individual here. And they do talk through non-interactive proofs. Uh, instead of walking through their explanation in detail, I'm just gonna show you a graph. So the gra this graph here is a uh, polynomial, polynomial graph. Okay, so we have these two lines here. Let's say that the blue line is the truth. So this is the thing that we, you know, this is authentic and we wanna to stick to this line. And then we have this green line, which could be, there could be a variety of lines. So there could be a red, there could be orange, purple, etc. But the importance is that these lines overlap. And when to make these lines overlap, the individual that's running the polynomial function or the properties or things related to that polynomial function, that should be um, lined up. So if they have the correct function and they're running it correctly and the prover and the verifier aren't necessarily cheating in any way, when the random number that's generated from the oracle that's sitting on the side of the system that sends that random number to the prover and they validate it through the function that they have for the polynomial um, setup, then when they run it correctly, they should always fall on this line. So whatever polynomial they provide, should stick on this line somewhere. So wherever it is, it should be on the blue line. If it ever falls outside of this, then we know that there's a higher likelihood or a probability that the um, properties that that prover is running through their polynomial function is incorrect. And it's probably um, malicious in some way where they're actually trying to modify or corrupt the zero knowledge proof ecosystem with that messed up function. So that will be the worst explanation you get for what this means. And that's exactly why I've linked both of these pieces here. Because if you read through this paper, it'll give you a better explanation with formulas and all that good jazz. Um, but also this video I've posted here is a presentation from Porter where he actually did a workshop series around zero knowledge proofs. And he gives a pretty brief explanation to this and I'd say the first 30 minutes of the first video. Um, so those are two good explanations to explain what non-interactive proofs are and how they function. There is another blog post here that I had. Ah, okay, here. So this link here, which goes to Matthew Green's explanation. This is part two of his, part, I think it's a two-part series that he walked through this stuff. Um, there's a section on non-interactive proofs. Let's, oh no. Non. Yeah, so it's a section explaining non-interactive proofs. And it explains a bit around how they function and the whole polynomial function piece that I mentioned. And these are the steps that one would have to go through and um, basically the benefits of using that hash function and how that relates to the polynomial properties that one would need correctly to prove the fact that they're a valid prover and they're doing this as expected by the validator. Um, so I'd recommend reading that as well, which will also be linked where everything else is. So I hope that wasn't too confusing. Uh, I think I went on a rant there around applications and roll-ups and all that stuff. So let's take a step back and get back on course. So we've talked through this, we've talked through the interactivity of zero knowledge proofs and the importance of non-interactive proofs within the crypto ecosystem for us to scale. So the next thing here is different protocols. So when you, when I first Google topics, I tend to drop on Wikipedia first, usually if it's a technical topic because there's usually less bias um, and it's pretty simplistic to understand at least depending on the, the topic you search. And when you look at this Wikipedia protocol or Wikipedia article, it shows you a table at the very bottom of different protocols for zero knowledge proofs. And if you go down here, you'll see in this column here that there's really three main protocols. So there's snarks, there's bulletproofs, and there are starks. Most of the time when you hear anybody talk about zero knowledge proofs within the crypto ecosystem, there's a higher likelihood they're just talking about snarks. Oh, they have snarks too. I didn't really realize that. Oh no. All right, so uh, snarks basically are the ones that everybody talks about. That's a lot of where the information you'll get when you Google um, zero knowledge proofs within the crypto ecosystem. 
Um, part of the reason that is, is because it's been around for a long time. You can see that the first one they listed here is in 2013, which comes with a lot of tooling, documentation, and lessons learned from previous iterations of this protocol. And it's part of the reason why I'm assuming so many people have built on top of it. And you can see that on this side, they have ZK systems. So these systems are basically implementations of this protocol. And you can see there's tons and tons of systems here. Um, some of the more popular ones you'll see were baked into a presentation that I came across, which will also be linked like everything else uh, here. And in this presentation, you can see this individual talks through um, some of the more popular uh, variations of this system. So here you can see that they've highlighted Bulletproofs, Starks, Plonks, and Halo 2 as some of the more prominent ones on this list that people are leveraging today. And um, yeah, so that would be an interesting video to watch in that presentation. And I don't think I have it saved there, but it's definitely linked inside of the, this post as well, as well as the resource list. So different protocols, Wikipedia, all that stuff. Um, probably should talk about the difference between them. Uh, let me look through here. So these two links here are going to go towards um, the navigating page. So this navigating one talks about the difference between Snarks and Starks, and so does this one. So this talks about Snarks and Starks as well. And this is probably, I would say, a really good explanation as well, where it talks through in more detail um, how Snarks function and how they correlate and the, ben the benefits and pros and cons between Starks and Snarks. I'll give a high explanation here um, inside of the post, but this is another topic that I will definitely do a video on, as well as probably a post that walks through the pros and cons and benefits of each in more detail. But just to kind of get it crossed in this video is a snark stands for a succinct, non-interactive argument of knowledge. A stark stands for a scalable, transparent argument of knowledge. So you can see the argument of knowledge here is the same. So this is very similar. And then the thing that's different is non-interactive and transparent, as well as scalable and succinct. So what does a snark actually do? So succinct, what does this stand for? Succinct basically refers to the fact that the proof itself is significantly smaller than the data it represents and can be verified quickly. Meaning that succinct, there's a, a limited size to every proof. A proof can't be bigger than X size, which means that the proving time is gonna be lower because they've optimized for that within this protocol. The next thing here is non-interactive. So we've already talked about what this means. There's basically no back and forth between Alice and Bob. We're going to have the prover, which is going to be Alice. She's going to prove, she's going to prove out specifically um, whatever validation needs to be done for the verifier. And there's going to be no back and forth so we can scale better. So this here argument of knowledge is referring to the ability to prove something to somebody and the soundness of that proof. So how many, how confident am I and the soundness of the proof that you provided to me. So am I 99%, am I 100%, what is the soundness to my confidence behind the proof you provided? And that's really what argument of knowledge means. So how strong is your argument of the knowledge you're trying to prove? And this is the same for Starks. That piece is identical, so I didn't include it here. And then for transparency for the, oh, that's, I should totally swap those. All right, before this video goes out, these are going to be swapped, scalable over here, transparent here. Um, anyways, so the transparent piece, which is referring to the T here, transparency referring to the fact that this is a non-interactive property, but the important thing here is it actually does not require a trusted setup. So snarks require trusted setups, which will likely be a, this here will probably be a separate post. But the point here is that there is, I think it's like called like the secret of Tau or secret of Tau something something tau and in the beginning there's this process that happens where it's like a magical ceremony and everybody gets together and they create some sort of randomness and they contribute multiple things so it could be a couple hundred people uh, 10 people how many ever and they're going to contribute to this pot of magic and out comes a randomization uh, algorithm that allows you to create hopefully almost random items and the starks actually do not need this and that is actually seen as a pro or a, a, a plus for Starks. Um, also, Starks are quote unquote post quantum protected. So Snarks actually in a post quantum quantum world would uh, be vulnerable to different types of quantum attacks. 
Um, and the scalable piece here for Starks is referring to the fact that it's uh, extremely scalable. Um, the proving times, uh, you can see this, the size of the proving time scales quasi linearly. And what that means is basically it's better that I think quasi linear is better than poly logarithmically. I think I could be completely wrong here. But the point here is that scalable is the fact that it's it's very scalable, it's fast. Um, it's faster than the succinct piece of snark in certain aspects. I wanted to note here, um, down in the kind of the italicized section, that snarks are faster to, in certain aspects, but also slower and bloated in others. And the reason I stated that is if you scroll down here, you'll see that there's some series of tables that actually do a comparison between snarks, starks, and bloat proofs and different proving sizes, times, and verification times. And when you look at a proof, uh, a prover inside of any snark or stark or anything else, usually there's a metric that's measured and the metric is around the size of the proof, the time it takes for it to prove, and also the time it takes to verify. And you can see that starks are faster with their proving time, but their proof size is a lot larger than a snark, which is a big deal when it comes to actually storing stuff on chain. So that's partly an issue with starks, partly a plus for snarks. Um, and then you can see some other metrics around the actual times and sizes. So that's one of the points I wanted to make there. Um, one thing I realized is I totally skipped over a really important piece here that I'll go back to. So I talked about um, soundness here. So where did I talk about sound here? So I talked about argument of knowledge and how, how strong is your argument of the knowledge you're trying to prove. And this really comes down to how sound the argument is how confident the verifier is in the argument the prover provided. So if I scroll up here, hopefully I actually wrote about this. I did, okay, thank goodness. All right, because I totally remember that I did. All right, here what we're looking at is um, three ingredients that make up a zero knowledge proof. These are the three main ingredients. Three main ingredients that make up a quality zero knowledge proof is the soundness, the completeness, and also the zero knowledge-ness of it. So soundness here is referring specifically to how confident are we in the proof system that Alice provided? So is the proof system that Alice is providing through her proving process, is this a valid proof system? Can we trust this proof system? And the way that we can trust this and understand that we do trust it is there's no way for her to provide us a false answer or cheat her way through this. And the way that that's gonna happen is through a series of magical, you know, things that are happening in the background with hashes and polynomials and, and all that stuff. But the premise here is that the proof system that Alice is using is a valid proof system. And in this example for Where's Waldo, um, as we provide more and more random um, scenes basically to Alice, she's able to consistently provide us Waldo through the proof system she's using. The completeness here is down to our confidence in the proof she's provided. So over time, as Alice iterates through the Waldos she's provided, our, our, um, our confidence increases in what she's providing. So we can see here the example is basically stating that if Alice is able to consistently provide her proofs to us showing that Waldo exists, then over time we're going to increase our confidence in her proof system and, and really trust the fact that she truly does know where Waldo is without showing us where it is. And then the last piece, zero knowledgeness, is referring to the statement that um, I'm only going to prove the fact that I know a statement or I'm only going to show you one piece of knowledge, but I'm unable to or unwilling to reveal the entire secret to you um, within this zero knowledge proof. And those are the main ingredients that make up a zero knowledge proof. There are a series of different explanations for these three main ingredients or people would say properties. And these properties basically um, are the main pieces that make up the, the protocols that we're going to refer to or we've already referred to when it comes to snark starks and, and bulletproofs. All right, another section or thing that we're going to talk through that's going to be short and sweet, I promise, is going to be the moon math that underlies zero knowledge proofs. So this will be likely at least a few videos and articles around me trying to grok as much as the math as possible, just enough to intuit what's happening underneath zero knowledge proofs, specifically ZK snarks, um, to really understand and potentially starks as well, to understand what's happening, um, to have a better intuitive understanding for it. With all that being said, 
Um, specifically, there's a few resources I found useful to understand what are the prerequisites to potentially build your own circuit with different languages that sit underneath these um, ZK Snarks and Starks. So this paper here, like I said, I've referenced this paper multiple times. This is likely a paper that I'll probably um, do like a, a grox to docs series where I'm basically reading through the document with you and trying to grok it as much as possible or at least walk you through what I've understood from it after grokking it myself. Um, additionally into that, there's a course here from Xerox Park which actually gives you prerequisites of questions that you should be able to answer before you actually embark on the course or at least it would be useful to know the answers to these to embark on the course. And in here you can see they specifically talk through modular um, arithmetic and also polynomials. They have some miscellaneous things down here, but these are kind of just basic kind of computational and technical questions. These are really the mathematical pieces. So most likely I'll spend, you know, a good amount of time doing some modulo math and Khan Academy as well as poly polynomials and series of other locations. But I'd say these two are the main areas to at least grok an intuitive understanding of um, zero knowledge proofs. The polynomials this is a good video from Khan Academy that explains the basics of what a poly polynomial is. Uh, and this course here, specifically Porter, actually talked through polynomials for about two to three minutes, maybe five. But in that brief explanation, he, he tried to provide somewhat an intuitive understanding of what polynomials are and how they fit within this zero knowledge proof specific application. So that's the moon math. Like I said, we're not going to spend a lot of time there. Um, at least not in this video. So the last piece here is the resources. Um, before I get into the resources, there's a few additional tidbits that I have saved here that I wanted to bring to light within this conversation. So this one talks about uh, snarks or starks. We've already talked about that. Um, uh, th oh, this is a, <laughs> just a random thing that I wanted to pull up. Not really random, but um, when you read through the series specifically from this group here on part two, they talk through recursive snarks and that's just a nether um, I guess tool in the toolbox for those that are developing on ZK Snarks or building out circuits for it is a way to speed them up um, by using basically Snarks within Snarks within Snarks. It's like Inception, um, but for Snarks. Some other stuff. Uh, so this picture, uh, there's those few graphs here that give you um, an understanding of who's playing where within the ecosystem for Snarks for Starks. So this one here shows you who's working with the Starks and who's working within Snarks. Um, you can see not this chart, but this one here shows you uh, where different uh, projects and companies are working within the ecosystem for the uh, kind of the areas they're working in. So you can see rollups is where um, StarkNet and ZK Sync are sitting. And that's where you probably see a lot of the conversations around different applications. Argent is a wallet that leverages ZK Sync for zero knowledge rollups. Um, and then there's the Validium, which is a separate topic that I think is briefly discussed, not here, maybe in this blog. Yeah. So this is actually an interesting piece that I didn't really find discussed anywhere else for the introductory articles. So this is a good thing to read through when it comes to um, Volatition. Volatition, I think it's called. Um, it's Briefly put, it's a, just a separate chain outside of Ethereum for data availability. So you can see you have Ethereum here, you have a separate chain here, and this ZK Porter, uh, which I think they've called Opportunity now, is a, it's like, I don't know if it's layer three or not layer three, but it's a way to increase the scalability of ZK rollups um, even further than actually just having a layer two on, stop, on top of Ethereum. Um, but that's just one interesting thing I came across, which probably itself will be another video um, for future reference, we've talked about that already. Um, ah, okay, so this is something I think we can end on, which I thought was quite interesting. So when people talk about zero knowledge proofs, they say proof a lot, they say proof, proof, proof. But when reading through this blog post and also I think a series of other um, pieces, I came across this, uh, this stack exchange or cryptography stack exchange that asks about the difference between a proof and an argument. And the reason I looked that up and tried to understand it is, and this blog post and another one that I probably haven't linked here, they talk through the fact that um, within ZK Snarks and Starks, they specifically and explicitly state that it's an argument of knowledge. They state argument. The reason they state argument is there's a um, there's actually a distinction between an argument and a proof. And my explanation here, once again, will be probably pretty pretty choppy as per usual. But the big difference here is that an argument 
in itself is less, um, I would say there's slightly less confidence in arguments than there are in proofs. But the important thing to point out here is that the difference is negligible and it's almost basically irrelevant to mention because a lot of people don't mention it due to the fact that it is, that's not much of a difference, but I wanted to call it out because you may see people talk about it and also thought it was interesting. So for a proof, the soundness, hence the confidence we have in it, um, is higher and it basically states that uh, within a proof, uh, a property we talked about for proofs required that it is hard for a computationally all-powerful prover to convince the verifier of a false statement. And this basically states that a computationally all-powerful prover, so like the, the God mode of computation, would be unable to prove the verifier a false statement because of the proof being so strong. But with an argument, specifically, um, it states that a system requires that it is hard for a polynomial time prover to convince a verifier of a false statement. So this is basically saying that a polynomial time prover is basically a weaker version of a computational all-powerful prover and they'd be able to prove somebody through an argument um, but not through a proof or at least there's less of a chance um, but like i said long story short this is negligible and it actually doesn't really matter that much but it is interesting to know that there's a, as a distinction between an argument and a proof argument is less strong proof is stronger when it comes to the soundness that we have behind that arguments being conveyed soundness aka confidence and then this stack exchange has a decent explanation as to why that's the case, and they reference the um, the computational unbounded prover, which is like the God mode thing, and then they also talk about the argument system and how it's a polynomial time prover. So I've just talked a lot; my throat hurts a little bit. And at the very end, so hopefully you've gone you've gotten to this point. And uh, resources, like I said, resources are here. So please, please, please go to the resources and check them out. But also, equally as important, you should subscribe to my newsletter. I have a news newsletter. The newsletter is called D squared. So if you go to subscribe here at the bottom of this blog post, it'll also be linked in the description. And it's also at the bottom of my website of every post. You can just put your email there and subscribe. And the subscription here is D squared. And you can see that basically it's every Friday, I send out a newsletter. That newsletter basically consists of uh, crypto security topics, different types of educational materials related to crypto and also general tech. And then the last one is miscellaneous things. So random things that I come across the internet that I think are useful for others to watch or at least entertaining to see. If you want to subscribe to my newsletter, I'd appreciate that. But if not, I also appreciate you watching this video. So either way, I appreciate you. All right, that's it. That's the end of it. I will see you in the next video, which I have no idea what the topic will be, but it'll be related to zero knowledge proofs. Thank you for sticking around and I'll see you sooner than a couple of months, hopefully.